This is the ZMAR Podcast. Elite Benefits of America helps small and mid-sized companies with their health insurance programs. And now, your host, Butch ZMAR. Welcome back to the ZMAR Podcast. Uh, today I have a guest, Corey Clark, originally from the East Coast, but he's here in Chicago. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, small and mid-sized company uh, marketing. Uh, Corey, thanks for uh, taking the time and coming on the show. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. It's a pleasure. Uh, so, Corey, uh, can you uh, give a little background for our audience um, that's listening to the podcast? Uh, where you you know where you come from and, and some of the things you're working on now? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I've got, you know, quite the extensive background, sort of bopped around over the last, you know, 15 years or so. Uh, I started my career originally in the Fortune 100 world, Fortune 100, 500, working um, in the consumer goods area and really was helping to drive a lot of digital marketing at the beginning of kind of the hype back when, you know, we were doing things such as keyword stuffing and trying to figure out how to be really good at paid search and Display was just sort of coming out. We were kind of shifting everything from traditional marketing over to digital. Um, and so since then, I've you know moved on from that area and have gone into you know privately held companies, government, nonprofit organizations, and then ultimately decided that I'd rather work for myself and choose the clients and projects that I work on um, instead of rinsing and repeating every year the same kind of project. Uh, so, you know, here we are in December, you know, and being like, oh, what did we do last December? Let's just kind of do the same thing and hope for the best. I'd rather innovate and try to change it and reach business goals and do something new um, that really aligns with what the client, what my clients are trying to do while driving some positive ROI. So that really pushed me over the years to say I needed some sort of change and some sort of move. Um, didn't know that necessarily I would start my own company, but here we are three and a half years later. They were founded in Chicago. Uh, I've got my deep roots in New England and heading back towards the Boston East Coast area. So who knows? This uh, East Coaster might be going back that way. <laughs> I was going to uh, say what, what, with marketing, you could pretty much uh, be anywhere. And I think a couple of times we had spoken that you were on the uh, East Coast. Uh, you know, from a marketing standpoint, speaking of, you know, just different locations, you know, have you, have you noticed some of the small and mid-sized companies that you do work with? Um, the strategies could be different based on, what you know, like we're in Chicago area versus um, the East Coast. Yeah, there's a little bit of difference that happens. I think um, it's not necessarily geographically, whether it's East Coast, you know, Third Coast being kind of Chicago or even like West Coast. It more so tends to be metropolitan versus rural. Um, even like in the Chicago land area, we see the clients that we have that are in downtown, even like Lakeview and just on like the north side of the city, there's a very different strategy at which that we approach them in order to reach their business goals. So if we're doing lead generation, it's just a different strategy and approach that we do it compared to somebody who's out in say like DeKalb. The way that the business runs for them, it's a lot different because folks are not so much in the metropolitan area as much as they're close to Chicago. DeKalb just kind of runs a little bit differently. And so we see the same thing on the East Coast. You know, when you're in Boston, whether you're in downtown Boston or you're in the really close suburbs of it, you know, there's a lot of really effective strategies that work well. But the second you start to branch out and head towards like the Berkshires and Massachusetts, it's a different approach for the marketing because you've just got a different audience that you're trying to reach. These folks just live a different way of life. It's not as fast paced. They're not as hustle and bustle and worried about everything that's going on. They're maybe not, you know, moving at hundred miles an hour like the rest of us are. They've got a little bit more time or maybe they're just thinking about the way in which that they buy products and they relate with brands just differently than folks do in cities. So there are similarities between, um, but I've really found that metropolitan versus rural really tends to be more of a dynamic shift. And I can completely see that even with some of my clientele, uh, they don't make up the New York minute for for no reason at all. And so, um, but now, uh, I mean, with that in mind, a lot of our clients, mutual clients, and of course, a lot of businesses do surround around metropolitan areas. And so a lot of things are on the move and you know, obviously that comes with strategies, right? And so, you know, mm -hmm. a lot, I, I'm sure you've seen it too, where a lot of these small businesses, mid-sized too, where they just kind of wing it. So like, can you walk through maybe... Um, 
you know, some steps that some of these businesses are missing the mark because um, they were trying to wing it and they're not really doing a good job. And then at what point do they reach out to a guy like you and start doing fractional marketing instead of hiring internally to kind of move to a different level? Of course, that's a great question. Um, I would say a lot of what tends to happen that I see, and I've seen this for years, even before starting Clark & Co. as you know, like a highly consultative digital marketing firm, I was seeing, you know, before then, and still the trend is true now that a lot of folks tend to see the shiny object and run towards it. You know, TikTok is out, it's new, it's fresh, it's exciting, people are creating content, they're getting lots of buzz, they're getting lots of followers, people get really excited about that. There's so much energy and engagement happening that they want to tap into it, which is great. It's great to have that kind of enthusiasm. But at the end of the day, I'm always you know, telling my clients and advising them, is that the right channel for you? Are the folks that you're trying to reach, are they really on that channel? And do you have the resources in order to make the content to sustain it? Because that's one of the biggest pieces. We all kind of run towards the next latest and greatest thing. But if we can't sustain it, we can't support it. And our folks that we're trying to target are not on it. It doesn't really make sense. So that tends to be one of the biggest mistakes. I've seen a lot of folks do that. And, you know, TikTok's being just one of the newer ones. The same can still be said, even with some platforms that have been out there for a decade or so. You know, we're talking like Facebook. People will go out and start blasting Facebook ads at who they think their target audience is. And then come to find out the people that typically buy their product or, you know, use their professional services or whatever it may be are not actually on there actively looking for them. They're on there looking for something else, or maybe they're just engaging with their family or maybe they're just not active at all on Facebook. And so one of the biggest things I always advise my clients is to look at the analytics and to look at the target demographics. Make sure that they align. You know, if you're going to start on a new platform or you're going to start some sort of new executional tactic, make sure you've got everything aligned with the way that it relates to your business. You want to commit 100% and you want to make sure that you have the right resources and can sustain it. But then also you want to retroactively look backwards after you've already started to say, okay, is this effective? Is this working? Because if it's not, you need to pivot. And that's the next hurdle that I see a lot of these folks run into is they don't pivot. They just continue to go as is because they made this investment and that continues to hurt them. You know, the more nimble you are, the easier it is to shift and make course corrections and that will help long term the longer you stay stuck in an area the more you sort of become archaic with it and that really hurts a lot of folks so when that sort of starts to happen um, i tend to find folks want to bring in a marketing person to say can you help us figure out what's wrong or i have an issue because tiktok's not performing enough for me my facebook ads aren't reaching the right people my advertising in general is just not converting to anybody who is going to make an impact on my business. Things like that tend to be brought up. And so I come in and say, as a fractional CMO, one of the big things that I do with my team is we come in and audit. We like to take a quick look and understand the lay of the land. We want to know what we're walking into. We want to get knowledge from not only the business owner, or any of the marketing folks that are involved, but really what's going on with these executional tactics to understand what were they trying to do? What did they do? And did they achieve anything that we could leverage? Because not every attempt is going to be a success or a failure, but there might be something in there that we can learn and leverage from. So that's a big piece when we come in, we want to always kind of learn and leverage from anything that we've tested to say, okay, maybe this wasn't the right path that we needed to take, but we tried it and now we know. So we can keep a note of that and say, you know, down the road, if we ever want to explore it again, let's remember what we already tried. So that way we don't do it again. We can try something different or a different approach. And so coming in as that fractional CMO, I think one of the big pieces a lot of my clients see and folks that I talk with is they just need that sounding board at a higher leadership level. They really need somebody who they can trust somebody who's been in the business and has been doing this for years and really understands how to help them get to their goals and then can relay that back to the team who's doing the executional tactics. So that way the communication is clear across the board 
instead of, you know, building a strategy at, you know, the sort of senior C-level management and then not sharing it with the folks who are actually doing all the work or who are on the ground who are doing really all the effort. So that disconnect is one of the biggest things that I come in and help with is making sure everybody's on the same page. So that way nobody's siloed and we all know why we're doing certain tactics and what they're meant to be doing, how they're supposed to be working. And then we always look back and say, okay, how are the analytics for this? Did they perform as we expected? Were they below? Were they above? Are there ways that we can optimize to make this better? Or do we need to pivot and make a change? And typically we'd have a plan if we need to pivot. So that way we know what we're doing next. Um, So that way it's not just kind of left and said, you know what? Didn't work. Got to walk away. Instead it's, well, this didn't work. Now let's try this. You know, there's always some sort of next step as a solution versus just letting it go because that can be really disappointing to a small to medium business owner. You know, they're putting a lot of investment in this. And they want to make sure that they're getting some sort of a return and at least knowing what they're getting for their money and their efforts. Well said, for sure. And so um, to, I guess, expand a little bit, you talked a lot about digital marketing. And obviously, that's, you know, the most current version of marketing um, and easy access and more affordable and uh, a lot of reasons. But What have you been seeing with some of these small and mid-sized companies that you've been working with, how they're integrating the traditional method of marketing with the digital? um, And then do you see any trends with this? Yeah, great great question. Um, I would say for a lot of the small to medium businesses that I'm working with, and specifically just right now thinking about kind of the professional services space, the way that we're blending it that makes sense is being really strategic about what we produce. So if we want to put together business cards, flyers, any print materials that we would consider traditional marketing, we're being really cognizant about how we're designing and developing them and always making sure that there's some sort of piece on it, whether it's a QR code or a website URL or a specific phone number that gives a call to action. Because we do want to take a look and say, okay, did our rack flyers actually produce phone calls for us? It's another tactic that is not digital, but it is something that we can track to a small degree. And it's something that we want to know if it is effective. So that's sometimes things that we do on the traditional side. But more so what I'm seeing is marrying together the goals with whatever the tactics are. So if we're running a lead generation campaign through advertising, say we're running paid search, we're doing display, we're maybe running some video ads, Um, that could include some testimonials from past clients or the customers. Um, And from there, we're really looking at, okay, we're driving over how many people that are interested, you know, maybe it's 100 per month. Of the 100 people, how many are signing up or taking the exact action that we need? And we're really diving into that further with our business owners and clients to say, you're having conversations with 10 people that came from this pile of 100. How are those conversations going? Are they meaningful? Are they the right folks? Are you, you know, do you feel like you're getting quality leads that make sense? Are they buying the right services or products that you are looking for? You know, when you kind of mirror that online and offline marketing, because for some of these businesses, not everything's fully digital. A lot of it does come down to a human aspect. You know, they need to pick up the phone to close the rest of the deal. Maybe you're a physical therapist and you need to pick up the phone and confirm their insurance, confirm that their appointment time, exactly what it is that you're going to be doing for treatment for them. There's a lot that goes into that that's beyond what we can do on just digital. So we always want to make sure that those are the right leads driving for them. If it's something more on the e-commerce side, it's a little bit easier to kind of tell because everything's digital all the way through. So we can look and say, okay, how many people are purchasing X, Y, and Z products? Are they putting one or multiple products into their cart? Are they coming back? At what frequency are they coming back? What's our lifetime value of each customer? You know, there's a little bit more that we can do on that side, which is really great. But then we also consider other sales channels. So perhaps they're selling their products not only on their website, but they're selling on Amazon. Maybe they're selling it through eBay. Maybe they're selling it through other retailers as well. And we want to look and see how are those sales channels performing in comparison to what we own, which would be our website. And so those are all kind of getting married together so that 
the small to medium business owner knows exactly how everything is performing within their marketing ecosystem. And that's a big deal. It's really connecting everything together so that they fully understand and can say at the end of the day, this tactic works, this one does not work. You know, instead of, well, what's working and not working? Something's moving the needle, revenue's going up. So this is great. Keep doing whatever you're doing. Sure. You know, we want them to be empowered to know what is working. For sure. Now, uh, you definitely talk about a lot of talking points related to analytics and and tracking it all, but obviously one of the first thing is driving the traffic, whether it's foot traffic in the door or if it's traffic to a website. And a lot of power that could be behind that is actually the employee base that people are hiring. Obviously, in my world, we provide, uh, you know, the benefits to to try to attract good talent, but now you got to leverage that talent, right? And so yeah. how do companies go about, because a lot of companies don't have guidelines on this at all, um, and and very few, I think, do, unless, unless you correct me uh, and your experience. But, but like, so how does, you know, how does a company go about, you know, having social media guidelines to help drive traffic in general and, and keeping, you know, the company brand and in mm-hmm. shape and keeping, you know, employees from doing things that could be obnoxious or, or something you don't want to see to, you know, to your client or prospect. You know, so what are you seeing on some of the guidelines that are coming out with some of these companies? Yeah. So uh, it's kind of, it's a hit or miss. Not everybody has guidelines. I think everybody aspirationally probably wants them and could benefit from them. But the hardest part that it comes down to is policing and enforcing them. Mm-hmm. And that's really challenging. You know, when you're a smaller business, you just have limited resources and it's hard to be on top of it. When you're a bit more of like a medium, a little bit larger of a company, you might have more of the resources that you can do. You might be able to purchase, you know, a listening tool for social media um, where you can kind of track and follow who employees are and sort of see what they're posting publicly and things like that. In order to kind of manage your brand, you might also have a PR team that could step in and help as well. But for a lot of the folks that I see, they don't have those luxuries. So what we do instead is really look at who are we trying to activate through social media. And when we have employees who are excited to talk about the brand, what can we provide them with so that they're pushing out the correct messaging? So really trying to get in front of it and say, hey, you know, we have some great assets that we're posting on our social media channels. We'd love for our employees to reshare, repost those, put them on your LinkedIn, post them on your Facebook, your Instagram, whatever you would like, you know, really kind of go that route. Really try to help folks say, go to the channels that the brand owns and repurpose that content instead of creating your own. We kind of use it as a two-prong approach of saying, one, you don't have to go create your own content as an employee, but two, as the employer, it saves you a bit of a headache of what could potentially be put out there as misinformation or off brand. You know, there could be the wrong colors used, the wrong fonts, could be the wrong type of imagery, you know, things like that. So you sort of can try to put a little bit of guidelines and guide rails around it. Um, Folks also might take the next level and actually build out social media guidelines, which we've helped with in the past. And those are really internal documents that outline what the purpose is of social media, what the strategy is for that company and brand, what social channels they have that they're active on. And it's a living, breathing document because the channels may change with time and the strategy may be updated from time to time. And then additionally, it goes through and talks about the do's and don'ts of social media. And I think that's a big one um, that we all kind of forget. Some of us, um, I know I did at least in college, took some classes on social media, which was so bizarre to think of from a long time ago, um, back when it was very new. Right. Um, but it was interesting to think about what you should and should not post on social media and how an employer could see that and how it could impact your employment status. And so that's always sat with me, but I don't think we're continually doing that anymore, at least that I know of. So that's something to be mindful of and to remind folks that you want to be as professional as possible on social media when you're sharing content about the company you work for or a brand that you're you know, an influencer of, that you're supporting and things like that, because it could look negative on you. But also as the brand, it's a good idea to get in front of it and build the content so that they don't have to. And then you can really help control how your brand is pushed through social media. 
So a couple different ways that you could go about that. But you you definitely bring up a lot of good points there. And and now I can see some employers that are micromanagement and and control freaks and and try to basically tell their employees to dictate it. But, you know, do you find more success where the employer actually gives a little bit more freedom, but maybe some, uh, I guess you could use the word too, boundaries, right? Like here, you know, stay within this window, but you could kind of do what you want. Um, Or have you had seen more success where it's a little bit more micromanaged? It can vary. Um, I think it definitely depends upon the type of person in management about whether or not they're going to be micromanaging. Um, Folks in the small to medium business space tend to be very busy, but there's a lot of passion. So depending upon the topic, if it's a hot topic that's being pushed out, like a new product, a new service, a brand refresh or relaunch, anything like that, it can be very sensitive and there can be a lot of micromanaging that goes on. I always advise control what you can but don't try to stress so much over it because at that point you're going to become obsessive with every little detail and you can't always control it. It it won't always be perfect. And sometimes having it not be perfect is actually great and it works well in your benefit. There may be something that pops up that ends up being a great opportunity to highlight your brand that you never would have anticipated before because maybe you get picked up um, by an article or you get picked up by another website that highlights you for something that they just saw that's great, that in your eyes, you're like, I should have corrected this. You know, I could have made it a little bit different. Everybody perceives everything a little bit differently. So I always tell my clients, let's do a soft launch and see how it goes. And then we'll do an official launch after that. So it gives us a little bit of wiggle room to test the waters on a small scale. And even if that's just sending out whatever the matter might be, whether it's a new product, a new service, updated branding to a small selective group, or just put it out in public and see if anybody natively finds it and see how they respond. And then we'll make a splash in a few days of saying we've officially done X, Y, or Z. Um, That tends to work really well um, because you get feedback. And I think that's Mm -hmm. a big piece is you want to collect that feedback from your target audience. You want to learn from them. You want to know what they respond well to. You want to know what they're interested in. You want to know if what you think is what they're thinking. Because at the end of the day, if you're trying to serve them, whether it's providing a service or a product, you want to listen to them. Otherwise, you're never going to be in touch with who your target audience is. If you own a business, Elite Benefits of America wants to remind you that health insurance open enrollments are either happening now or coming very quickly. And this is the time to review and implement a health care plan to make or keep you as the employer of choice. Deadlines for open enrollment range between November 1st and January 1st. Get ahead of the curve. The Small Business Special Enrollment Period, part of the Affordable Care Act, now allows employers with 49 employees and under to offer health benefits without contributing a dime to the employee plan. Help your employees save money on taxes with health insurance they're already paying for with their hard-earned dollars. Butch Zemar from Elite Benefits of America wants you to reach out to him today. Visit EliteBenefits.net or call 708-535-3006. With a lot of the content marketing or just marketing in general, a lot of these employers that are listening to this podcast, you know, uh, some of them all of a sudden maybe one day says, I want to be on the front page. Why am I not on the first page when I when <laughs> when, when someone does a search? And, and and I've even heard this like, you know, just through the meetings that I've had that are not related to marketing. Um, if it all of a sudden becomes important or they're struggling with it, can you provide some insight on, you know, why does it take so long to improve that brand to get, you know, in the rankings and, you know, and, and, and why is it not showing up right now, you know, kind of thing. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a great question. Um, SEO truthfully is a long game. I think it's one of the things that's really hard for all of us to understand, even those of us in marketing who are so close to this, we're so used to instant gratification that anything that takes longer than I don't even know if there's like quite a quote about how many seconds or minutes that a gratification really is perceived as great would be to humans, but I'm sure that there is some data that could back that up to say if it's 60 seconds or 90 seconds, you know, is as long as we'll humanly wait before 
our mind is sort of like, okay, this is taking too long. Um, SEO takes long. And there's a reason behind it. It's because the search engines and algorithms are so sophisticated and they're constantly changing and evolving because of the way that we all interact with the internet. It's the way that we are going through and researching different types of content, the way that we're consuming content, how we're engaging with it, and then the way in which people are building websites and building digital experiences on websites or creating video format um, you know, to put on YouTube, to put on Vimeo, to put anywhere else that's out there really is just so sophisticated at this point, it's hard to make SEO impacts instantaneous. There are some things that can be done on a quick win side, and I say that with air quotes, not that you can see it, um, <laughs> but really some of the quick wins are making sure you fill out things such as like the title to your page, the description, you know, that metadata that feels so archaic and old. It's such a quick win in my book for SEO. It's something you can do that just helps tell search engines what the page is. You know, they're going to go back and mirror it with the content on the page and double check that you're not keyword stuffing and, you know, saying something incorrect about the page. But it is a way that can get you some quick visibility. Also, other ways are just having enough content on your website. Like right now, you know, we're still looking at 1500 characters plus on a web page to be optimal to be ranked higher, but that's constantly changing and evolving. The way in which we're using keywords is changing because we're all searching for content so much that our actions are changing. We're getting more sophisticated. We're no longer using Google like we used to where we'd have you know, the plus sign in between words with quotes around them because we wanted a specific search for you know, best marketing agency in Chicago. You know, we're not, you know, searching that way anymore. Now we just type in marketing agency in Chicago and we just look for it. We don't see what we want on page one. We research. We might type in something different to that and say, you know, marketing agency in downtown Chicago, marketing agency in the West Loop of Chicago. It really sort of, we refine our own searches. And so the search engines are trying to keep up with that and to better understand how to serve content based upon how we are engaging with the internet. But then secondarily, we're almost getting, and we are sort of getting really qualified on our own of how we engage. So each of us, you know, being signed in, whether you're signed in with your Gmail or into the web browser, what it may be, you've kind of got your own persona that's getting tons of different data points that are being collected about who you are and how the search engines can better serve you content based upon your previous actions. It's a little creepy. It's a little big brotherish, um, but there's plenty of documentaries out there that really highlight this and show you that based upon how you've been interacting with the internet, it will start to serve you different content. The way that I search for something is very different than it is for you. And so that's an interesting piece to take into consideration. If you've got a target audience of 100,000 monthly you know, users who are looking for your product or your services and your brand, those 100,000 people all search differently. So how do you create effective SEO for 100,000 different ways that people search? And that's why SEO takes so long. There's so many different ways to go about it, but we're constantly always trying to find the right way in which we can produce content and make SEO optimizations that are strategically smart and sound to better rank our pages long term. And then it takes time for our target audience to engage and interact with it before it truly does start to rank because the search engines are so sophisticated with their algorithms and constantly learning. Will the day come and change that all of this sort of shifts? Who knows? It might right. be on the horizon. It yeah. might see a future shift. We don't know yet. I'm not one building an algorithm. So I can't quite tell you what happens next, um, right. but I do try to follow them. And honestly, I don't think there's one person out there who fully understands how the algorithm works from start to finish. There's, it's just so sophisticated. So, so speaking of change, right? So just uh, change is constant. It's the only constant, right? Of course. So 
Yeah. So what what are you seeing as far as changes or trends that are uh, occurring not only in 2022, but as we move into um, 2023, recording this in December of 2022, uh, what are you seeing uh, upcoming changes or upcoming uh, trends that are, are expected to for these small and mid-sized companies? Uh, that's a great question. I love I love talking about trends because it is that time of year uh, that everything's sort of coming out. Um, one of them, I was kind of talking about it before, TikTok is here. I mean, it is. It's another platform. There are millions of users. It'll be interesting to see if we reach 1 billion users on TikTok globally. Um, it's something that I've kind of kept an eye on. It's short form video content. And we've been talking about this for years, that it's so consumable. People can digest it very easily. They love engaging with it. And you can just endlessly scroll. And that's really how TikTok was developed. And so there's some TikTok SEO that's starting to happen, which you're probably like, wait, what? Social media and SEO, how does that go together? Right. Does it even make sense? Well, there's a couple different ways. It's the keywords that you're using when you're writing your descriptions. It's the hashtags that you're utilizing on your content, whether you're being specifically niche versus doing like a broad hashtag such as like hashtag TikTok video, like that's probably used over a million times, you know, very simple ones like that. But also it's even going further into creating relevant content. These algorithms are learning what type of content you're creating with their AI technology. They're able to understand it. And then as well, visual elements and impacts that you're making. So ways in which you're getting people to stop and look at your content, whether it's the top piece of your video, the middle or the bottom or somewhere in between, any way at which you're capturing folks to get them to stop and engage is now becoming a social SEO item, which is really interesting. It's just another way in which people are engaging with us and we've got to be strategically smart with how we create this content. You know, it's no longer just put up a fun little 15 second video of you dancing and holding up a brand's product, that's not going to move the needle. It's about being really impactful. And so this is just how the social media evolution always continues. You know, we start with some really fun trends and then it goes really deeper from there. And so TikTok SEO, it's here. (laughs) We're all, you know, sort of embracing it and seeing where it's going to go. That's one big trend that I've noticed a lot um, that I think is interesting. Kind of branching off of it, AI and marketing is here, the artificial intelligence. It's a really hot topic. Um, It's really coming into play. And I think this is where a lot of small and medium businesses are going to be left out. They're not going to have folks who know enough about it that they can lean on and leverage to say, how does this impact my business? And is there something that I can do here that would really help me? You know, should I look into chatbots for customer service? Not just a basic one, but a sophisticated one that almost feels like you're talking to a human. Because we all know when we're talking to a fake chatbot, we do it on the phone too. You know, when you keep getting asked, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that. Can you repeat it? We start to scream support, support, support. You know, you, you want to get through to a human. So AI is constantly evolving to a point that it almost seems real. And so that's a big piece that's coming through that small to medium business owners can really take over because they're limited on resources. So what a great way to make better engagement with your target audience by making some automations, whether it's a chatbot, email automation, website personalization, which personally is one of my favorites, customizing the journey on your own website for the individual user. Um, is great. Those are just more ways to get them to convert with what you are trying to get your target audience to do, whether it's to purchase, to sign up, to schedule time with you, to buy your services, whatever it may be. Those are a couple of big ones there. Mm -hmm. Um, Another one that I still like to highlight, I'll just do a couple of my favorite here. I've got a long list. Content. Content's still king. Content is huge. People kind of forget that we need to still build content. Um, And it's more than just copy. It's having really quality landing pages that are SEO friendly and built with great intention, but highlight your brand really well. Having a smart homepage that highlights who you are, what you do, why it's relevant, and what you want the user to do. Those four pieces are key to a successful landing page 
for whether it's your homepage or it's a secondary page that you're trying to get somebody to convert on. And so that content that you build around that is really key. So that way the search algorithms and engines can really pick it up and help get you more of that long-term SEO benefit. You won't see it tomorrow, but you might see it in six to eight months. And you may be saying to me, well, that's crazy. Well, if you start it now, here we are in December. Well, by the time you hit Q4 of next year, you're going to be in a really good spot. And so it's something that people need to start thinking about now, especially those small to medium business owners. So my last one's analytics. Um, always look at your analytics. To me, it's like a no-brainer. You know, as long as you've got good analytics and good tracking, and if you need to hire and outsource to have somebody make sure that your analytics are set up correctly, do it. It's one of the smartest things I think you can do as a business owner and leverage that data. Understand how people are engaging with your website, with your social media, with your email marketing, how they're engaging with maybe different tracking phone numbers that you have if you're in the call business a little bit more, like if you need appointments through phone calls and things like that, and any of those other different areas. Leverage that data to understand where are people engaging with you and where are they converting to make you money? Is your website converting as best as it can? You know, Is your direct mail campaign running as great as it was three years ago? Think of things like that, utilizing that analytics to make those decisions. Because I think data will always drive the best decisions as long as it's quality data. And I'll always stand by that. Well, yeah. definitely great stuff. You know, every time I hear, you know, marketing trends, you know, the first thing I think of is, uh, I don't know if you remember that AOL dancing baby back in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, we're a long uh, way from that, but uh, definitely, um, you know, things that uh, businesses have to keep up the speed on. And so as we wrap up, you know, it is December and we talked about trends and, you know, some things that small and mid-sized companies, but, you know, for something to do for the holidays, I know you're a big uh, skier. You got any skiing trips uh, planned and coming up? I've got a few kind of on the horizon. Um, as I'm heading back to the East Coast, I got the Epic Pass for skiing. So trying to be able to ski anywhere pretty much in the U.S. I know you can go international with it, but for me, it was the smart choice. So being able to ski with my family back in Stowe, Vermont, um, but also even with some family that I have in Southern New Hampshire, and then some of my really good friends out in Utah and Colorado. So, so far, haven't booked all the trips yet, but I'm planning on at least hitting, I don't know, somewhere between a dozen and two dozen mountains this winter. Oh. It'll be very active um, compared to the last couple of years for me. Yeah, especially with COVID and all. And yeah. uh, hey, you know, but... Uh... You know, this has definitely been great. And in between all the ski trips, uh, how do uh, you know the people listening to this podcast? How do they get in touch with you? What's the best way to reach out and maybe expand the conversation we've had today, um, as well as uh, maybe even engage you if they need it? Of course, uh, a couple of great ways to always get a hold of me. The website you can go to my website at coreyclark dot co c o r e y c l a r k dot c o. Trying to be fancy there instead of doing a dot com. Um, but you can also reach me via email. Um, I'm always on my email, Corey at CoreyClark.co. It's kind of the biggest piece. You know, I'm very adamant about keeping my inbox under two dozen emails every day as best as possible. It's one thing that keeps me mostly aligned and clear with everything that's going on. Um, but I also try to get back to everybody as best as I can. And, you know, really kind of looking at those two channels are really working the best for us. Well, definitely sounds good. And I'll make sure it's in the show notes and I appreciate your time. And uh, I look forward to actually having you back on and talk about more trends going forward. And then what, you know, some of the challenges small and mid-sized companies are, are dealing with. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a wonderful time.